Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Bob Stiegel, and I have the, the privilege of presenting the first talk at this year's Back to Basics track, CPPCon 2020. Each session in this track is about a single concrete topic like this one, which is about the C++ abstract machine. Our goal with the track is to produce content that covers important things that you need to know to be a working programmer in today's C++ community. That being said, many thanks to our Back to Basics chair, Arthur O'Dwyer, for putting together the track program, and to our conference chair, John Kolb, for making CPPCon such a great conference. I'd like to begin by providing a basic idea of what an abstract machine is in general, and then move on to describing the C++ abstract machine in particular. I'll briefly cover some of the language goals that drive the design of the abstract machine and its role in our program development and execution. I'll provide some important definitions and hopefully we can tease out some interesting characteristics of the abstract machine. And I'd like to do this in somewhat of an axiomatic way. Axiomatic in that I'll try to, try to build a picture from the ground up. It's not truly axiomatic, of course. This is not hardcore math. We'll talk about important components of the abstract machine and their relationships. My goal, really, is to provide you, the viewer, with a useful overview of the C++ abstract machine in the hopes that it will help you a little bit, at least, in your day-to-day -day work. There's actually very little code in this talk. There are, however, a number of definitions and diagrams that I hope will explain the C++ abstract machine a little better. So let's begin with some definitions. So what is an abstract machine? Um, opinions vary, of course, and I've provided three general purpose definitions here. I will read some of the highlights. For this definition, which comes from a paper published in 2000, the salient characteristic is that abstract machines provide an intermediate language stage for compilation. They bridge the gap between a high-level programming language and the low level of a hardware. A great post on Quora by Sergei Zubkov defined an abstract machine in this way. Again, reading only the highlights. Programming language specifications define the languages in terms of an abstract machine, which in this usage is the simplest imaginary computer capable of executing a program in the source language. That's, a, that's actually a very good definition. And finally, from the Free Online Dictionary of Computing, it defines an abstract machine as a processor design not intended to be implemented as hardware, but which is the notional executor of a particular intermediate language, an abstract machine language that's used in a compiler or an interpreter. Now, what is the C++ abstract machine? Well, I like this definition that was given by Bryce Edelstein Lelbach at Core C++29 last year. Bryce says that the C++ abstract machine is a portable abstraction of your operating system, its kernel and hardware. The abstract machine is the intermediary between your program and the system that it is run on. And that's a nice, concise, terse, and spot on definition. So why do we use abstract machines? Well, we have complex information tasks that we need to get done. We want to write programs in some human readable language to help us get these tasks done in a reasonable amount of time. And of course, human readable for productivity. Nobody wants to look at machine code anymore. We want tools that will robustly and reliably take our programs and transform them into a form that can execute on one or more computing systems. And in C++, these tools are primarily the compiler and the linker. In today's world, we have an enormous variety of computing platforms from general purpose CPUs, which I think is probably what most of us think of when we think of programming, to GPUs and specialized coprocessors, which are sort of these days achieving their own prominence. And then finally, embedded processors, which are found in everything. I think it's interesting to note the percentage of systems that use general purpose CPUs relative to all systems in the world. I've seen estimates of 95% or higher being embedded devices. So given all this, it is impractical or perhaps impossible to create a separate language and set of tools for every computing platform. This was done a few times in the early days of computing until people realized it just couldn't be done 
for every new platform. So we want tools to help us manage complexity. When we write our programs, we don't want to be concerned with the details of the underlying physical hardware. We want our languages capable of representing abstractions relevant to the problem domain at hand. And we want programming languages that transform our programs to executable form on one or more computing platforms. To solve problems like this, we humans like to use abstraction. And so we define our programming languages in terms of abstract machines. Virtually every modern language, and even some old ones like Algol, defined abstract machines. So you could legitimately ask, what drives the design of the C++ abstract machine? Well, there was a great paper, uh, P2137, published at the committee, which set out a set of goals for the language. Now, I was not a signatory to the paper, but I agree wholeheartedly with the points that they made in it. And they contend that C++ should support performance critical software, uh, evolution of software and the language itself, code that's easy to read and write and understand, practical guarantees regarding safety and testing, fast and scalable development, and the ability to support current hardware textures, architectures, platforms, and environments as they evolve. I wanna dig a little bit into some of these that I think are most directly related to the C++ abstract machine. For performance critical software, Really what we want to do is give the programmer control over every aspect of performance. C++ should always have tools available to, to address performance problems when they arise. Code should perform predictably. The reader and also the writer of code should be able to understand that code's expected performance, giving an understanding of the underlying execution environment. In performance, um, sorry, so we want to leave no room for a lower level language. In other words, a programmer should never need to look under the hood and have to switch to another language to improve the performance of a program. Finally, as hardware and operating systems and environments evolve, we want the way we generate executable code for them also has to evolve. And we need a framework to do this, a generalization mechanism that allows us to evolve as these external things evolve. So how does C++ meet these goals? Well, C++ has no layers of abstraction between it and the hardware. There are no interpreters or virtual machines like the JVM. And because of this, C++ can perform high quality code generation in the compiler backend. Literally, there is no room for another language between C++ and the hardware, unless you wanna drop down into assembler. C++ maps types and operations very directly onto hardware. Most of the fundamental types, if not all of the fundamental types, map directly into memory entities. Things like pointers and references and arrays map directly into the hardware addressing capabilities of most modern uh, microprocessors. And modern hardware supports a wide variety of very useful arithmetic and logical operations on those entities. In general, and to sum it all up, C++ defines how programs work in terms of an abstract machine, a machine that's deliberately defined to be very close to the hardware. So let's look at that a little bit. When we write programs, our programs describe operations that we would like to have performed. And in a sense, those operations are performed on the abstract machine. So we start with our source code, we feed that source code into a compiler, and from our perspective, the compiler emulates, in a sense, that program running on the abstract machine. It checks, it checks the syntax and the constructs in our program against those that are legal to ensure that the, the code, if, if there actually were hardware that implemented the, the abstract machine, would actually execute. Now, the implementation, the underlying compiler and tool chain, it translates the abstract machine operations into physical machine operations. So at the same time, it's emulating our uh, program on the abstract machine. It's mapping operations occurring on this, this, on the abstract machine into machine code. And it's the machine code that actually runs on, an on a physical machine. When we write programs, 
this is our area of concern. We want to make sure that our source code meets the requirements specified in the standard and by the compiler so that it can run on the abstract machine, even if it's only running in an emulated or virtual way. The compiler's concern is to take that same source code and turn it into optimal machine code that runs on hardware out there in the world. So one central thesis here, and the th if you take away one thing from today's talk, you should take this away. When we write C++ code, we are writing, we are targeting the C++ abstract machine. Now, I don't normally like to read a lot, but what I'm going to do is start with some very important definitions that are in the standard, and I'm going to read some of the highlight, highlighted sections. As I mentioned before, I'm trying to build an axiomatic view of what the C++ abstract machine is, and so I have to start with these crucial definitions. So the abstract machine is defined right up front in the standard in section 4.1, and at the very beginning of that, it says, the semantic description in this document define a parameterized, non-deterministic abstract machine. The document places no requirement on the structure of a conforming implementation. Uh, rather, conforming implementations are required to emulate only the observable behavior of the abstract machine as explained below. So there's some interesting tidbits here in this first portion of the definition. There's some things we need to understand. So there was a mention of implementation. There was the mention of parameterized and non-deterministic. And there was this interesting statement that contained the term observable behavior. Implementations must emulate the observable behavior of the abstract machine. Well, implementation turns out to be one of those terms that the standard doesn't define directly, at least not that I could find. And so I'm gonna substitute my definition in here. So when I say implementation, and hopefully I'm using the word correctly, I mean tools that verify the program on the abstract machine and generate a corresponding executable image. And these are generally the things that we call the compiler and the linker. At the bottom of that same page is a very interesting footnote that, that provides some, some very useful, uh, very useful definition. It says this provision is sometimes called the as if rule because it's an implementation is free to disregard any requirement of this document as long as the result is as if the requirement had been obeyed. For instance, an actual implementation need not evaluate part of an expression if it can deduce that its value is not used and that no side effects affecting the observable behavior of the program are produced. Okay, so there's some more adjectives and nouns of interest in this. So the, the definition of the abstract machine mentions expressions and non-observable side effects. And so I take that to mean the opposite of observable behavior. Continuing in 4.1.2, certain aspects and operations of the machine are described as implementation defined. These constitute the parameters of the abstract machine. Each implementation must include documentation that describe its characteristics and behavior in these respects. So implementation defined behavior is what characterizes the parameterization of our parameterized non-deterministic abstract machine. Now we can deduce from this that implementation, implementation defined behavior is allowable and it has to be documented. We should be able to look up somewhere in a document online or on paper where some implementation defined aspect of an implementation is provided. Moving back to the definition, where possible, this document also defines a set of allowable behaviors. Notice they don't say must be documented. These define the non-deterministic aspects of the abstract machine. An instance of the abstract machine can therefore have more than one possible execution for a given program and a given input. All right, so unspecified behavior is allowable behaviors that the abstract machine can engage in. The difference between unspecified and implementation defined is that unspecified is undocumented. But nevertheless, it's allowable. Moving on, certain other operations in this document 
are described as being undefined. Uh, and then it gives the example of trying to modify a const object. Now there's a very important note that follows. This document imposes no requirements on the behavior of programs that contained undefined behavior. So here's another characteristic. The fact that an operation can be undefined. And when that occurs, there are no requirements on the behavior of those undefined operations. Literally anything can happen. A conforming implementation must produce the same observable behavior as one of the possible executions of the corresponding instance of the abstract machine, given the same program and the same input. All right, so now we're beginning to get a picture of what observable behavior is. What this is telling us is that there are many possible valid execution paths observable behaviors that occur that could occur in the abstract machine. And the implementation, the physical code that's running, must match one of them when it runs. The next part, I'm not going to read all of this to you, but basically what it says is that it defines what observable behavior is. If accesses to data are made through volatile, uh, volatile variables, uh, data that's written to a file at the end of a program, and interaction with I.O. functions that are part of the library. When those things occur, that is observable behavior. Those are points in the execution of a program where the state of the program can be observed. So observable behavior, I think of it as being execution state information that's exchanged over time with some outside entity. And finally, what are side effects and what is an expression? So further in the standard, it describes side effects as being changes in the state of the execution environment. And it lists four, four instances in which that can occur. Reading an object that's marked as volatile, modifying any object, including volatile objects, calling a library function that does IO, and calling a function that does any of the above. So that is what defines side effects. An expression, a little bit simpler. An expression is a sequence of operands and operators that specifies a computation. The important thing here is that an expression can result in a value and it can cause side effects. So now we have our final piece in the puzzle here of our characterization. So I think that with these uh, sentences and these descriptions, we can begin to form uh, a concrete understanding of the abstract machine. So let's move on. Remember, our programs describe operations performed on the abstract machine. When our source code is compiled, it is as if the compiler is emulating our program that's running on an abstract machine. The implementation translates these abstract machine operations into physical machine operations. It emits source code, it links it, and that's what actually runs on the physical machine. At the end of the day, with a conforming implementation and correct code, there will be equivalent observable behavior between the, the two machines, the physical and the abstract. So let's pretend we're watching a program in action. We have our abstract machine and we have our physical machine. We feed them some input and we start them on the path of executing. As they execute through time, there will be points at which observable behavior occurs. And I've labeled these points as interactions in this presentation uh, as a shorthand for as a shorthand for the statement, observable behavior is occurring at this point in the execution state of this machine, be it physical or abstract. And so Interactions will continue throughout the lifetime of the program. And perhaps when the program ends, there will be some output. With correct data, a correct program, and a conforming implementation, at these points of interaction, the observable behavior must be equivalent. Now this diagram is actually slightly simpler than the real case. Because remember, there's a non-deterministic aspect to all of this. So here, what I've tried to do 
is indicate with the fuzziness of the lines that there is some non-determinism. So for example, here, when a physical machine is executing between two points of observable behavior, there are some paths of execution that occur that we can't know what they are, kind of like quantum mechanics. And at the same time, in the abstract machine, there are corresponding paths of execution that are occurring, but we just don't know what they are. It's non-deterministic. But at these points of interaction throughout the lifetime of the program, and at the end, when we write our output, you can see that in a sense, the probability waves collapse and the observable behavior uh, of the physical machine must correspond to what have, would have been observed if the program was running on the abstract machine. And as before, at these points in the execution of the program, the observable behavior must be equivalent. So for example, just to take another example, suppose we have two threads, T1 and T2, and they execute in the time frame between this first interaction and this uh, second interaction. Let's say that thread T1 does 20 units of work and thread T2 does 25 units of work. And when they complete their work, they write data to a file or send data to an output terminal or do something that causes a side effect. Well, this is an allowable interaction. This is correct observable behavior and there must have been a path in the abstract machine that ended in those two results. Likewise, on a subsequent invocation of the program, if T1 does 137 units of work and T2 does 1,729, then in a correct program with a conforming implementation, the observable behavior, those units of work, must have, must, there must be a path in the execution of the abstract machine where that behavior would have occurred. Okay. I'd like to also provide a couple more important definitions that uh, go a long way to helping describe the abstract machine. The first is a well-formed program. A well-formed program is one that's constructed according to the syntax rules, the diagnosable semantic rules, and the one definition rule. And what this really means is this refers to a valid program, valid at least as far as the implementation is concerned. Implementation defined behavior. We've mentioned this before. The standard says that this is behavior for a well-formed program a well-formed program and correct input data that depends on the implementation and that each implementation documents. So what this is doing is this is referring to behaviors of a program that vary between implementations. For example, compiler X running on Windows versus compiler X uh, running on Linux. And this refers to, again, the parameterization aspect of the abstract machine. So what are some examples? Well, size of void. I could have a compiler that runs on 64-bit hardware and the same compiler run on 32-bit hardware. And so the size of a, of a pointer will be different on each of those platforms. And this is implementation-defined behavior in that a compiler will document the fact that pointers have uh, eight bytes, a size of eight bytes on 64-bit platform and a size of four bytes, say, on a 32-bit platform. The value of char bit, which indicates the number of bits in a byte, uh, which uh, has to be at least eight. The text that's returned by stood bad alec what? Uh, implementations are free to substitute whatever message they want, as long as they define what that message is in their documentation. And finally, locale specific behavior, which depends on the implementation supplied locales. Next up is unspecified behavior. And the standard says that unspecified behavior for a well-formed is 
for a well-formed program and correct data is behavior that depends on the implementation. And it, as I mentioned before, notice that there's no, uh, there's no mention of documentation in this case. So uh, the corollary that goes with this is that each unspecified behavior has to yield at least has to yield exactly one result from the set of all possible valid results. Remember that fuzzy diagram uh, at those points of observable behavior, when I observe some execution state information on the physical machine, there must have been some path of execution on the abstract machine that would have provided exactly the same results. In this case, I don't know what paths were taken, and so that's unspecified behavior. And this, again, this describes the non-deterministic aspect of the abstract machine. So, for example, the order of evaluation of arguments in a function call. If F takes two arguments and the first argument to F is a call to G and the second call to F is a call to H, the standard doesn't say whether G is going to be called first or H is going to be called first. It leaves it up to the implementation and the implementation doesn't need to document it. And in fact, the order of evaluation of invoking G and H can vary within the same program. There are no rules that say what order that in which that has to occur. Another unspecified behavior, uh, to pull another wild example out, is whether identical string literals, which occur, uh, which are sprinkled throughout your program, are stored distinctly as separate copies of that string or as one copy of the string. Another uh, important bit of unspecified behavior is the order, the contiguity, and the initial values, value of storage that's returned by successive allocation requests. Uh, when you allocate memory, the compiler, the implementation, is under no obligation, in a sense, to conform to any sort of uh, order of where the return memory exists or where the return buffer exists in memory. It's under no obligation to say that if you do two allocations in a row, that the second buffer is actually physically right after the first buffer or vice versa. And it makes no promises regarding the initial value that lives in the bytes that are returned uh, by that uh, allocation request. Here's another very important concept, that of undefined behavior. Undefined behavior, well, simply is behavior that is not defined or for which the document imposes no requirements. By imposing no requirements, it's not defining any behavior. So it's undefined behavior. In this case, when undefined behavior occurs, there's no restrictions on the behavior of the program. Compilers are not required to diagnose undefined behavior. A program with undefined behavior is not actually required to do anything meaningful. For example, if you dereference a null pointer or access memory outside the bounds of an array, uh, you commit the sin of signed integer overflow, or you access an object through a pointer of a different type. All of these behaviors, these are things that you can do, but the standard says they're undefined behavior. The standard makes no guarantees about what the implementation will do, what the abstract machine will do if any of these behaviors occur. Let's talk about what ill-formed means. An ill-formed program is a program that's not well-formed. Uh, this is a program that has syntax errors or it has semantic errors that the compiler is smart enough to diagnose for you. When ill-formed behavior occurs, an implementation has to issue a diagnostic, even if that implementation defines some language extension that assigns a meaning to such code. So for example, variable length arrays. Some compilers, as an extension to the language, define a facility called variable length arrays. Now this is a non-standard feature, and by default, your compiler is required to issue a diagnostic warning you that you're using this non-standard feature because it's non-standard. Now, of course, you can always uh, 
tell the compiler not to provide you the warning, but absent that explicit instruction to the compiler, it has to tell you that, um, uh, that you're using an extension. So the standard uses the words shall and shall not and ill-formed to indicate that requirement, the requirements that have to be met for a program to not be ill-formed, for a program to be well-formed. There's another characterization, uh, characterization here, which is called ill-formed, no diagnostic required. In this case, this means that the program has semantic areas, errors, but those errors cannot be diagnosed at compile time. So if you run a program that contains an ill-formed, no diagnostic required error, the behavior of the program is undefined if you execute the program. So what are some examples? Uh, violations of the one definition rule. When a constructor delegates to itself, whether directly or indirectly. Declaring a function no return in one translation unit and declaring it without no return in another translation unit. So let's dig in a little bit to the structure of the abstract machine. There are I think of it as being three important pieces that the machine is made of. First important piece is memory. Memory provides storage. It provides storage for objects, which for the most part reside in memory. And the third leg of the stool is that we have threads. Threads are flows of control that carry out the operations that we have requested or specified in our program. So let's dig into each of these things in a little more depth. Let's talk about memory first. The abstract machine views memory as a single flat space. All parts of memory in the abstract machine are equally reachable by the abstract machine. There is no conception of memory hierarchy. The abstract machine does not recognize the concept of stack, registers, or cache. Although, incidentally, stack unwinding is mentioned several times in regard to exceptions throughout the standard. The abstract machine has no concept of heterogeneous memory. For example, memory that might exist on a GPU or a coprocessor or some other thing that is external to the processor on which your physical machine is running. Now, taken together, all of these imply that access to memory has uniform latency. The standard doesn't say this explicitly, but I think it's a fair conclusion to make. Uh, given that it's a flat address space, all parts are equally reachable and that there's no hierarchy. Otherwise, if latency varied from one part of the abstract machine to the other, there actually would be hierarchy. Memory is composed of bytes and the standard specifies the minimum requirements for what a byte is in terms of what it has to be able to represent. The memory that's available to a program, made available to the program by the abstract machine, consists of one or more sequences of contiguous bytes. And any operation that occurs in a program can potentially access any memory location in those sequences of bytes that the abstract machine has supplied to the program. Every byte has a unique location in memory, its address, and addresses are represented in our program by pointers. Let's move on to objects. Objects in a program create, destroy, refer, access, or I'm sorry, operations create, destroy, refer, access, or manipulate objects. Objects have size, which can be determined with size of. They have alignment, which can be determined with a line, a line of. They have storage duration, which can be automatic, static, dynamic, thread local. They have a lifetime. They're temporaries or their lifetime is bounded by the storage duration of the storage in which they exist. They have type, which I think of as being a tag that specifies a representation and the valid set of values that representation can have along with behaviors that are allowed to occur with that representation. It can have a value, which can be indeterminate. And optionally, an object can have a name. Some objects in C++ have no name. 
like the value that's returned uh, when an object is returned from a, uh, from a function. It's important to note that an object can have at most one memory location. Actually, it can have zero or one memory locations because an implementation is allowed to store two objects at the same address or not store an object at all as long as the program can't observe the difference. And this is the as if rule at work. If storing two objects at the same memory location or not storing an object at all has no effect on observable behavior, then the implementation is free to not actually store the object. An object having a memory location is stored in a contiguous sequence of one or more bytes. And here is just a little drawing showing an int32 existing in a sequence of bytes. The address of an object stored in memory is always given by the address of its first byte. And as I mentioned before, the address is represented by a pointer. And pointers are themselves kinds of objects. Arrays of objects and data members of classes may or may not occupy contiguous sequences of bytes. In other words, structure padding is permitted. However, uh, as we all know, we index arrays contiguously, even though the elements in an in array may have padding in them. So the little picture on the top shows two different variables, x and y, laid out in memory. And it just so happens that y comes immediately after x. Now, these are 32-bit integers consisting of four bytes each. And I'm assuming that I have four byte alignment of my data in this picture. In the picture at the bottom, I have a type, a struct called S, and S consists of a short, and I'm assuming that it has two bytes in this picture, and it has a char, which is one byte. Now also assuming four byte alignment, an array of three elements of type struct S will be laid out as you see. And there will be, there will be a little gap an unused byte between uh, successive elements. This is perfectly allowable. Now pointers can point to the one past the end element of an array and one past the end element of an object. So if I have a pointer, if I have an object X and I have a pointer PX that points to it, I'm allowed to form a pointer, I'll call it PE, that points to the byte immediately after x. This is a perfectly allowable and supported operation. Likewise, if I have an array, my, my original array of three elements of type struct s, I'm allowed to form a pointer to what would to the end, the end pointer, the one past, uh, the one past end pointer, which occurs at the place where a fourth element would have been had there been fourth elements, and clearly I've got a little typo there. Pointers to objects can be compared in certain circumstances. For equality and inequality, when they point to the same type, for ordering when they point to elements of the same array, and for ordering when pointing to data members of the same class. So here's another little example with my mislabeled three, three element array and another element of type S that happens to be instantiated afterward. So here's my code. I've got my struct S. I'm creating a three element array, and then I'm creating an individual object of that type. And it just so happens in this case that the compiler laid it out in this, in this fashion. So which comparisons are allowed? Well, I can compare PB, this address, with PE because they're elements of the same array. I can compare for equality PB with PX, which is the pointer to X, because they're pointers to the same type. I can also compare PD, PB to PX for inequality. I can order, I can compare PB to PE for ordering because PB and PE are both elements, both point to elements in the same array. However, I cannot compare PB to PX, even if X is in the spot where a fourth element of that array might have occurred because X is not an element of the array uh, S and it's not the one past end pointer either. Another property of objects is that they have a property called storage duration. 
As I mentioned, there are four kinds of storage duration. There's automatic storage duration, where object storage is allocated at the beginning of some enclosing block and deallocated at the end of the block. And this is the kind of storage duration that we're probably most familiar with. When we're writing code inside a function, we declare a variable uh, to do something inside that function. That's automatic storage, automatic duration. This applies to all local objects in our code. Objects that are defined inside of blocks, except those that are declared thread local, static, or external. We also have dynamic storage duration. This is storage duration that we as programmers have explicit control over. And in this case, our object storage uh, is allocated and deallocated by the program using functions to perform dynamic memory allocation, right? Objects with this duration are created using new expressions, i.e. the new operator, and they're destroyed using delete expressions, uh, like using the delete operator. We have static storage duration, where object storage is allocated for at the beginning of a program, and it's deallocated at the end of the program. In other words, its storage is allocated before main is entered, and it is deallocated after main is exited. Static storage duration uh, storage applies to all objects that are declared at namespace scope, including the global namespace. This is where global variables live, or file, file global variables live. This also applies to any object that's declared static or extern. Those objects are all stored in storage, which has static duration. The consequence of this is that there's only one instance of an object with a given name with static duration in the entire program. We also have thread storage duration, something that came with C++11. And this is object storage that's allocated when the thread creating the object begins, and it's deallocating when that thread, deallocated when that thread ends. This applies only to objects declared thread local. This is automatic storage that's uh, tightly bound to a thread. And the storage exists when the thread starts, and the storage is released when the thread ends. In this particular case, Every thread has its own instance of an object if, it, if that object has thread duration. An object has lifetime, and the lifetime of an object of type T begins when storage of the proper size and alignment is obtained, or whatever that storage duration might be, and its initialization is complete. In other words, after the, after the constructor is executed. The lifetime of some object OBJ of that type T ends when the object is destroyed if T is a non-class type, like say an int, or the destructor call starts if T is a class type, like string. And finally, there's another condition having to do with reusing storage uh, when storage in the object occupies is released or reused by an object that's not nested within OBJ. So basically, this conforms to our common sense. The lifetime of an object is strictly contained within the lifetime of the storage that contains the object, and the object's lifetime begins, from our perspective, after the object is constructed or initialized, and it ends immediately before the object is destroyed. Let's talk about threads. A thread of execution is a single flow of control within the program. And importantly, this includes the initial invocation of a specific top-level function, and it recursively includes all of the function invocations that are subsequently executed by the thread. So when a thread starts, there's a top-level function, the thread function, and that thread is responsible for executing uh, all of the functions that are subsequently called inside of that top-level function. And I, of course, as we all know, a C++ program can have more than one thread running concurrently. Every thread in a program can potentially access every object and function in the program. And this is a consequence of the rules, the guidelines that we mentioned regarding memory. So when a thread creates another thread, the initial call to the top level function of that new thread, the thread function, is executed by the new thread not by the creating thread. Well, of course, there's one very special top-level function that we all use, and that's main. 
And there are several rules that go along with MAME, uh, restrictions on how it can be used. It has to have C++ linkage, linkage. An implementation has to provide at least these two forms of the main function, although an implementation can provide more. It can't be overloaded. It can't be a coroutine. Main cannot be called from within a program. It can't be deleted. It can't be static, inline, or const expert, and so on. Importantly, main is the entry point for the program. So when you execute a program, what happens is the outside environment starts the main thread of execution, does some initialization, and then it calls main. That initialization is initializing objects of static storage duration. The initialization occurs before main is called and that storage is destroyed after main exits. Every program, therefore, must have at least one thread, the main thread. And the top level function for every program is main. So what does it mean to invoke and execute main? Well, that takes us to the question, what does it mean to invoke and execute a function in general? Well, we know functions consist of statements. Statements consist of expressions. We also know that an expression is a sequence of operators and operands that specify a computation and that the expression must be evaluated to actually do the computation. When we evaluate an expression, we, get, we can get a result, and the process of getting that result can cause side effects. So in summary, evaluating expressions that cause side effects can result in changes to the program's execution state and possibly to the observable behavior. And here I provided this bullet to sort of tie into that list of characteristics that we put together at the beginning of the presentation. Every C++ expression has an associated type. And every C++ expression is a member of a value category. You've probably all seen this little diagram, which is used really to help explain what R value objects are and what L value objects are. So, I'll give a quick overview. A GL value is an expression that basically uses the name of an object. If you take the name of an object, if you use its name, if you take its address, if you return a reference to an object from a function, if you pass a reference, that is a GL value, a generalized L value. On the other side of the coin is a PR value, and the P stands, I think, for pure. At least it's been said that P stands for pure. And a PR value is an expression that initializes an object or bit field and uh, computes the value of the operand of an operator as specified in the context in which it occurs. So what are some examples? Literals are examples of PR value. They don't have names and you can't take their address. Uh, function calls that return a non-reference type, like returning by value. If you return a string from some function, that string is an R value. An X value is a GL value uh, whose resources can be reused. So an X value expression has an address that's no longer accessible by your program, but you can use it to initialize an R value reference, which provides access to the expression. So an example here, function calls that return an R value reference, uh, like std move, or casting to an R value reference, or any expression that designates a temporary object. And then finally, an L value is very helpfully defined as being a GL value that's not an X value. And an R value is either a PR value or an X value. So as we learn to program in C++, we develop some intuition about objects. And after some experience, we begin to understand when we can take the address of something. And it's a sort of a rough guideline, but it's a useful guideline. If you have the name of something and you can use that name or you can take the address of that thing, then in general, you can think of it as being an L value. If that thing doesn't have a name or it's a temporary or you can't take its address, then think of it as being an R value. Now that's not a perfectly correct characterization, but in my experience for typical day-to-day -day work, it's good enough and it works. 
So functions consist of statements, statements consist of expressions, an expression is a sequence of operators and operands that specify a computation. When we evaluate an expression that causes side effects, we can have changes that uh, we can change the program's execution state and, and possibly affect observable behavior. The rules that govern the evaluation of expressions are formulated in terms of an expression's type and value category. That's why I covered them. The idea of an expression having a type and a value category is the basis for all the rules, or I guess probably most of the rules in the standard, that describe how an expression is to be evaluated. And type and category are two, two important parameters into that equation, if you will, that, that determines the outcome of evaluating an expression. So in summary, our programs describe operations that are performed on the abstract machine as I've tried to denote in this diagram. We create source code, we feed it to a compiler. The compiler effectively emulates that program running on the C++ abstract machine. Implementations translate abstract machine operations into physical machine operations. And so here we have the compiler taking, uh, mapping the operations from the abstract machine into machine code and stitching it together to create an executable that runs on a physical machine. Implementations must emulate the observable behavior of the abstract machine. So here we have some indeterminate, non-deterministic behavior that's occurring in the physical machine and we get some observable behavior at a point of interaction. There must be in a correct implement, in a uh, conforming implementation and a correct program with correct data, there must be an equivalent path of execution through the abstract machine that leads to the same observable behavior at that point of execution. Finally, the abstract machine has memory that provides storage, storage for objects, which for the most part reside in that uh, storage, and threads, which are flows of control that carry out the operations specified by the program. And here's, again, a very simple picture of the abstract machine. So in summary, again, the one point you should take away from this, if you take nothing else away, when you write C++ code, you're not targeting a particular physical machine, unless you know, you're writing device drivers or something. You're not targeting specific hardware you are targeting the C++ abstract machine. Okay, thanks for attending. Uh, uh, later today, this talk and, and my second talk will be up on my GitHub site, and there's the URL for my blog. And so now I'm going to move over to Remo and answer some questions, perhaps for the next three minutes. So let me go there. Okay, so there's a question here. The question is, you said that there is no room for another language between C++ and the hardware. How does LLVM fit into this? Well, I'm not an LLVM developer. Uh, so my understanding of LLVM is that it is a set of tools for developing compilers. And part of that set of tools is Clang, the C++ compiler, and in Clang, it implements the code that, uh, that describes the C++ abstract machine. Now, I, as, I think that historically LLVM was intended, originally meant low level virtual machine, and perhaps it still does. But it doesn't indicate any sort of layer between, uh, between the compiler or, or between an executing program uh, and the hardware. It's simply a set of tools, well, not simply, it is a great set of tools that allow you to build a compiler, Clang, and a linker, uh, LDD or LLD, uh, to compile and uh, link C++ programs. There's another question here. Why is the abstract machine considered non-deterministic when aspects that vary from one platform to the other could simply be considered as being additional parameters to a deterministic machine? 
Well, I think uh, to answer that, the non-determinism comes from the fact that there are flows of execution that can't be specified or documented. Um, for example, generating a random number, a pseudo random number generator. Suppose you have a high quality pseudo random number generator. You know between two points of observable behavior that you're going to invoke that random number generator and that you're gonna generate a result. Now, the non-determinism comes from the fact that as the pseudo random number generator is doing its job, it's computing the random value, it is difficult, if not impossible, to understand what is actually happening under, under the hood. When the observable behavior occurs, there must have been a flow of control through the abstract machine that is equivalent to the flow of control that occurred in the physical machine that will lead the same uh, lead to the same observable that, uh, behavior, the same result from the random number generator. We can't specify, we can't know in advance what that behavior is going to be. All we need to know is that when the observable behavior occurs, when we interact with the outside world and we read that random number, we write it to a file or we print it to a terminal, that the f there must be equivalent flows of control through the physical and abstract machine. And I hope that answers your question. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to present this first talk. And uh, everybody have a great conference and we'll see you in the hallway soon.